Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to part four of Fight Club. I feel like this is like week seven, maybe even eight of weeks we haven't been able to meet together. And I know if you're like me, you are tired. Like you're tired of this. You're ready for things to go back to normal. You're ready to sit in class again and do work even if it means being around people again. Um, look, I right there with you, I am ready for this to be over with. This is long overdue to be gone. But look, endure with patience. Um, stay in the Word. Look, we are looking forward to the day where we can gather together again. And look, until that happens, we're not going to stop praying for this thing. I know there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Some states are opening back up a little bit and starting to ease restrictions. I don't think Alabama's quite there yet. I haven't really kept up with the news today but um look keep praying we're gonna we're not gonna stop praying until this is over and then we're gonna keep praying afterwards but look don't don't ease up on looking forward to the day where we get to gather together again and look i've said it probably every week i'm gonna keep saying it we miss you guys we love you guys and when we come back together we are going to throw the biggest party possible that first wednesday night back we're gonna go all out so look look forward to that Go ahead and start inviting your friends when that gets closer and closer. We don't know when that's going to be yet, but we'll kind of announce it as we're given instructions by the authorities on when we can start meeting together again safely. And so keep praying. But tonight, we're in part four. Uh, this is actually going to be a two-part sermon. Next part will be next week um, called Fight Club. But we're, we're in this part of the series where we're talking about the fights that we fight for other people. Um, and so tonight, the, the, the title of the message is Fighting in the Gap. And if you're kind of just now joining us, you're probably like, well, what in the world is this all about? What is Fight Club? Look, like, you gotta go back and catch up with this, this YouTube channel. All the parts are there, part one, two, and three are there. Um, please feel free to go back and listen to those and get caught up with us. It'll all make sense when you get up to this point. Um, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about some heavy subjects, and I know the messages were a little longer. Tonight's message is super simple, um, but we're going to be in Romans chapter 10. So if you have a Bible, go grab one really quick. Um, turn to Romans chapter 10. If you don't have one, go steal your brothers or your sisters or your moms or your dads or the internet. Use the internet. Whatever you got to do, pull up Romans chapter 10. And look, if you're like me, if you've ever opened the book of Romans, it's heavy. It's wide. It's deep. It's like, what does that even mean? I don't know. What, I've never heard that word before. Look, you are not alone, okay? If you've ever tried to read it, even Peter in Scripture, in the Bible, Peter says, yeah, some of Paul's writings are actually really difficult to understand. You're not alone. Peter had the same issue, okay? So we are in the same boat. It's okay. This is a very deep theological book. If you've ever read it, you know it will challenge the way you think about the gospel, about God, about our salvation, uh, but it's a very good book, one of the deepest theological books in all of scripture, and probably one of the most hard, one of the hardest to understand next to Revelation, and so um, Romans chapter 10 is where we're going to be. Just to give you a little bit of context leading up to this, we're going to start in verse 14, but this is where Paul is talking about how to be saved and what it means to be saved. He's, this is where the famous verse Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That comes in this chapter. And so that's kind of the context we're looking at. Um, Paul's talking about, you know, salvation by faith alone and stuff like that. And so he's talking about calling on the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved and, and believing in him. And so we're going to start in verse 14. And then I'm going to read it. I want you to read it along with me. Um, and we're going to talk about it. Tonight's message is going to be super short, straight to the point, okay? Starting in verse 14, Romans chapter 10, it says this. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let me pray for us real quick and we're going to jump right into this. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. God, help us to just forsake ourselves, Lord, and to, to look to our King and our Lord and to realize that the mission of the church and the people of the kingdom is urgent. God, help us to be about your business. God, 
help us to, to dive deep into this truth tonight, Lord, and help us to take it seriously. God, we, we, we don't get a lot of these types of moments together and, and much less in person. So, Lord, even though we're meeting digitally right now, God, help us to take your word seriously. It's authoritative. It's truth. It stands against the test of time. It will never change. So, Lord, we ask all these things in your mighty, mighty name. Amen. Amen. So, hey, um, we're in Romans chapter 10. This is kind of a familiar passage. It's talking about salvation, Paul, um, here. But this is kind of the crux of, like, what it's meant for Christians to live. Like, why are we here? Um, and it's super simple. We are here for two reasons. God's glory and other people. Believe it or not, we are here for two simple reasons. God's glory and and other people. We can find this right in the two greatest commandments. The first greatest is love the Lord your God with everything you have, right? And Jesus said the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We exist. That's why we're here. God didn't save us and snatch us up. We we didn't like get baptized and disappear up into the heaven like he has left us here, not alone. If you're in Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. You have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That power is in you. Okay? We, we're not alone, but God has left us here to accomplish a mission. And that mission is building the kingdom. So how do we do that? Like, let's just get super simple tonight. How do we build the kingdom? Especially like in a place like isolation and quarantine. And we're going to get to that towards the end. But how do we build the kingdom? Well, what is the kingdom made of? People, right? You and I make up the kingdom of God. The kingdom is made up of people. So people are the mission. Does that make sense? People are the mission. How do we build the kingdom? With people. People are the mission. So our mission of building the kingdom requires people, and this is why we're here. This is why you and I exist. For God's glory of building the kingdom because it will give him glory and praise and honor. And for people because people are required for the kingdom. The two are married to each other. God's glory and other people are why we're here. So why, why do we have to do, what does this have to do with fighting? Fighting in the gap. It's the, it's the, it's the, the title of tonight's message, Fighting in the Gap. What does it have to do with fighting? Exactly that. People are not easy. You throw a wrench into this whole thing called sin, right? You throw the wrench of sin into this whole thing and it messes up everything because sin is the, the whole purpose of, and the reason why Jesus had to come in the first place. And now it makes people difficult. Sin makes everything difficult. Because now things are messed up. It's not like you just go out there and say the gospel to somebody and it's like automatic flip a switch salvation. It doesn't always work like that. Sometimes people reject it. Sometimes people want to think about it. Some, whatever. And so you throw this wrench of sin in and it makes things easy. And so we are standing in the gap. And I'm going to explain this in just a second. But we stand in the gap for people. We fight in the gap for people. And look. People don't realize they need the gospel. If they realized that they'd already be saved and we wouldn't have a mission. If everybody realizes, I need the gospel, I need Jesus, then there wouldn't be a mission. The, pe the reason why there's a mission is because people don't realize they need this gospel. They need the truth. They need the gospel, but they'll never hear it if we don't go. And that's what Paul's trying to say here. They will never hear it if you and I don't go and look. I want to make this very clear, okay? This passage is not explicitly about being a foreign missionary going to a foreign country. That is not what Paul is talking about here. And that is, look, that's all okay. God calls people to do that. I'm not saying there, there's nothing wrong with that by any means to go into the mission field and serve as like for what you do as a living, right? I've got friends who do that. But that is not explicitly what ta Paul's talking about here. He's not saying, like, we should really, you know, find somebody, send them to Asia. No, he's saying, like, the world needs the gospel, and you and I, the, the disciples of Jesus, the Christians, the little Christ, we're the plan. We are how God has designed it 
for us to go into the world wherever we go. Doesn't have to be a foreign mission field. It can be in your classroom. It can be on the field. Or right now, since there's none of that, it can be in your home. Whoever you're around, they're the mission. Well, what if they already know Jesus? Good. You get to encourage them in their walk. And praise God, you have people around you who know Jesus. Not everybody does. But everywhere you go, you're, wherever your feet are, that is your mission field. It doesn't have to be a foreign country. You don't have to go to Africa or Asia or, or wherever to be on mission. The moment you say yes to Jesus, you are on mission. Your life has been changed and now you exist for God's glory and others' benefit by bringing them into the kingdom. That is why we are here. And that is very clear throughout scripture. Our lives are no longer our own. When we say yes to Jesus, we lay down our lives for the mission and glory of God. And that is why we exist. This doesn't mean that everybody goes into ministry. It doesn't mean that everybody becomes a missionary and goes to foreign countries or whatever. This means that God has created you with your gifts, your talents, your DNA, your passions, your abilities, your whatever. Whatever makes you up to who you are. God has created you that way so that you, wherever you are, you're on mission. And this is, my dad is a good example, right? My dad, and I, I, I do too, but obviously God had different plans for me. He called me into ministry. But my dad loves working with his hands. Could have done anything he wanted to. But my dad chose to go into uh, to steel machinery, uh, tool and die. He's a tool and die specialist. Loves working with his hands. Great at math. I didn't get that trait, <laughs> but he's really good at math. He just loves and enjoys doing things with his hands, so he went into a trade. And he, as a Christ follower, is on mission every day he goes to work. Whether he realizes it or not, he exists in that workplace, not to just make money, not to just support a family. not to, He is there, first and foremost, on mission, and God designed him that way. Maybe we never think about it that way, but that's how God has designed this. Number one goal before anything else, mission of God, glory of God. This is what we are designed for. In the world, you're on mission. The mission never stops. At home, you're on mission. With your friends, you're on mission. With your parents, you are on mission. With anyone and everyone you come in contact with, you're on mission. Wherever your feet are, that is your mission field. Don't ever forget that. You don't have to get on a plane and go a thousand miles on the other side of the world to be on mission. Wherever you find yourself, you're on mission. The mission never stops. The entire purpose for why you and I exist is that exact thing, the gospel, and taking it to a lost and dying world who needs it. That's why we exist. And I think maybe we've forgotten it's sad to say, but I think it's not that necessarily we've forgotten, but maybe we just don't understand the weight of what's at stake here. Like, people's eternities are on the line. People's eternities are on the line. If you are in Christ, then your entire eternity has been changed. You have been brought from death, eternal death, to eternal life. If you do not grasp the weight of that, you need to read the gospel over and over and over again until you do. Because your eternity, my eternity, has been changed from death to life. We could not do that on our own. This is not something that I could do, that Matt Ragsdale could, oh, well, I'm in death, so let me just move over to life. No, I can't do that on my own. Jesus, this is the whole purpose of why Jesus came. To bring us out of death and into life. And as Paul says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the whole purpose. Our sins have been forgiven and we stand clean before a holy God. And that is not something for us to take lightly. This should change how we read the word. This should change how we worship. If we truly grasp that our eternity has been changed and we had nothing, no way to earn it. Given as a gift, that should change everything for us. And even how we live, moment by moment, day by day, week by week, year by year, on mission. And if you believe the gospel to be true, then you must, you have to take this mission seriously. 
You can't take it lightly because, look, if we believe this to be true, and we do, this is why we meet, this is why we're here, this is why we're doing what we do right now, this is true, then the Bible is clear about what happens to people who die without Jesus as their Savior. Separated from God for eternity. They will die in their sins and be eternally separated from God. And, and that is something that should shake you and me to the core. I want to be like Paul. And even though it's not possible, I want to be like Paul. I want, to, I want to have the heart like Paul that says, if I could give up my salvation for my brothers and sisters, I would. He sa- and he says it. It's not possible, but I, that's how much he loved them and how much he wanted people to come to know the gospel. He would give up his own salvation if it was possible just so somebody else could have his spot. Take my place. I want that to be our heart as a church here in America. The mission is real. The mission is urgent. That is something that should shake us to the core. Eternity. Not just physical life. Eternity. It does not end. Eternity is forever. Millions and millions and millions of years will go by and you haven't even scratched the surface of eternity. Does not end. But if that's not, a lot, if that's not enough, their lives depend, their eternities depend on whether or not you and I Take the truth to them. Their eternities depend on whether or not you and I take this gospel to them. God could have chosen any part of creation. Any part. He could have made the waters roar the gospel. Or birds sing the gospel. Or trees talk the gospel. Or he could have written it in the sky so the entire world could see. But he didn't. He chose you and me to be a part of this plan to take the gospel to the world. And we should be humbled and honored by that. We should be humbled that he would choose us. But instead, he chooses you and me as carriers of this good news and says, I want you to be a part of this. I want you to be a part of this. Take this good news, this life-changing, eternity-changing news to the world, and we should be honored to do it. We should be honored to do it. But the truth is, most most of the time, we're ashamed or frightened to talk about the truth of God's Word. The gospel, the good news that has changed us, that we claim has changed us. And if we end up letting our fears and our shame get in the way of whether or not someone hears the gospel that could change their life forever, then we should be ashamed of ourselves. There should be nothing that holds us back from sharing this good news with the world. Nothing. This is why the early church was persecuted. Nothing could stop them. They they had their lives threatened and even they were thrown in the Colosseum to lions and made fun of as they were dying, yet they still preached the gospel boldly because they believed it. They trusted it. So my question is, do we, do you truly understand the weight of the gospel and the weight of eternity or are we too afraid to share Do we truly understand this? We need to quit focusing on things in life that do not matter. This is the only thing that matters. So what does it look like? What does it look like to fight in the gap? Talking about fighting in the gap, what does that look like for us as Christians? It looks like the gospel. It looks like the gospel. You and I are sinners against the holy God. We know this. And because of our sin, we've been separated eternally. Eternal separation between us and God No hope, no way for us to fix it. Nothing. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. Bible makes that clear. He, God, a holy God cannot exist in the presence of sin. He hates sin. It's against his very nature. So we have no hope. There's nothing. We got nothing. The Bible says we are dead in our sins. Guess what a dead man can do? Nothing. Can't even breathe. Dead man can do nothing. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. But God being rich in mercy made a way when there was no way. This is why we sing the song, Living Hope. 
There was no way. And our God is not dead. He is alive. Jesus comes into the world, born of a virgin, lives a perfect, holy, sinless life, and dies the perfect, perfect sacrifice, substitution for our sins. His death was our place. But in his death, he defeated death and sin, rose from the grave. Three days later, defeating death and hell and sin. And in that place, instead of us getting death, we get life. We get Christ's righteousness, which covers our sin. God closed the gap when we could not. He sent Jesus. Was no hope. So thank God he loved us enough. He loves us so much that he made a way. He closed the gap himself. And he made a way, and now we close the gap for others. We exist for others. This is the whole purpose of what Paul is saying. Nobody's going to hear if we don't go. Nobody's going to hear if we don't speak up. Nobody's going to believe if they can't hear the truth. Nobody's going to realize they need the gospel if they don't have somebody telling the truth to them. Is it awkward sometimes? Absolutely. But eternities are on the line. What we do is by closing the gut, by closing the gap, and what I what I mean is we're not saving other. We don't save people. We can't save others. What we do is we go to them, because nobody else is going to. We go to them, and we tell them the good news. We tell the world about our living hope that Jesus has conquered death in the grave. We don't believe in a dead God. He is alive. We just celebrated Easter. He is alive forevermore. And we do not believe in a dead God. Our God is alive and reigns forevermore over all things. So now that we have been changed, we stand in the gap and we tell others about the good news of the gospel. We go and we preach the gospel so that others can hear and believe. That is our purpose. That is our mission. This is our call. This is the kingdom. Please. Let us never forget that. Let us never forget why we are here. So how do we do this in quarantine? How do we do this in isolation? Nothing is stopping you from preaching the gospel. And nothing should stop you from preaching the gospel. Now is a fantastic time for the church to get creative on how to present the gospel to people Write a blog, make a video. When you're out in public and you have an opportunity, words don't fall short at six feet. They don't. You can have a conversation six feet apart. Be bold. Do not be ashamed of this good news. If it has changed your life, then it should change the way you live. And you should have a burden for people who don't know the gospel. Not just in other countries, but here. Right here in Corner, Alabama. Father, thank you for your truth. God, help us to take seriously your word and understand the weight and the urgency of what's at stake. God, this, this, this is not just some life thing. God, this is eternity. And people's lives are on the line. So Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to not forget the weight of what's at stake. Help us to be the church who does not back down no matter what. We stand firm on our rock that does not move and we proclaim truth into a world that is broken and proclaims lies. So God, give us courage, give us boldness, give us a heart for the lost. God, change our hearts. Help us to live missionally minded every day we wake up. And help us to fight in the gap, to close the gap for others. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.